All right, now it's time to introduce our keynote speaker. And as you may know, we had actually planned for Lidewa Edelkors to speak today. Unfortunately, she recently lost her husband and was not able to join us in the end. We wish her well. Now we are very proud and honored that Safia Mini is willing to take her place and is willing to share her vision um, for a revolution of the industry with us today. Safia Mini is a pioneer in ethical business with a track record of establishing fair trade supply chain solutions, defining PR and marketing campaigns, but also outlining strategic directions needed to reach new markets. Uh, she is currently the managing director of Pozu, an ethical footwear brand. Back in 2001, she launched the brand People Tree. And now, nearly two decades later, over 200 European retailers sell People Tree sustainable fashion and accessories. And I have to share with you, I'm the proud owner of these People Tree earrings. Thank you, Safia. Now, People Tree was even the first fashion company to receive the WFTO label for certified fair trade throughout its supply chain. And it doesn't stop there. She's been featured in the True Cost documentary that looks at the impact of the garment industry. And she's also a strong activist against modern slavery. Her book, Slave to Fashion, highlights best practices that show how the fashion world can flourish without forced labor. An accomplished author, an inspiring and passionate spokeswoman, and a strong leader in sustainable fashion, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Safia Mini. Thank you so much. And now, before you get started, one more thing to you. If you have any questions for Safia during her speech, feel free to answer them in Bossmaster, because we'll have time for Q&A after her speech. Good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm honored and, and really humbled to be amongst you. Um, my uh, great friend, Marius of uh, Continental, um, reintroduced me to Fairware Foundation a, a, as little as two, three years ago, um, having spent more than 20 years in Japan. Uh, I'm shy to say that I hadn't realized just what an amazing network and, and resource and sharing community you are. Um, so I'm, I'm here uh, to share, but also uh, to learn. And um, thank you so very, very much for inviting me along um, to, to share some of the journey. Now, um, I attend a lot of conferences and seminars, and I, and I always think if I, if I get three exciting things to take home from that experience that I can put into action, um, then I'm winning. Um, but I, I realize that the standard with which this, this conference has been produced is so incredibly high. So um, I'm just hoping that we can glean, um, I can share with you enough that's useful from, from my talk today. So I'd like to start on the journey. Um, firstly, um, the True Cost movie, I know many of you have seen it, but I'd like to refer back to it. So I'd just like to show you just a two minute trailer. We communicate who we are through clothing. It is fundamentally a part of what we wish to communicate about ourselves. We used to have a system, a fashion system. That has absolutely nothing to do with the fashion industry today. It has been reinvented. It's based on materialism. The problem is that comes at a really high price. The garment factory collapsed, killing more than 1,000. Clashes between clothes factory workers and riot police in Cambodia. Last November, 112 people were killed in another major factory fire. 30,000 Chinese workers and women Garment workers in Bangladesh are paying the price for cheap clothing. Well, the promise of globalization was that it was going to be a win-win, that consumers in the rich world would get cheaper goods and people in the poorer parts of the world would get jobs and that those jobs would give them an opportunity to work their way out of poverty. This enormous, rapacious industry that is generating so much profit, why is it that it is unable to support millions of its workers properly? The actual business model is completely unsustainable. Unless you change that model, 
you can't change anything. When everything is concentrated on making profits, what you see is that human rights, the environment, workers' rights get lost. My God, we can do better than this. I, I, without undermining our lovely Buzzmaster, I'd like to ask if you could raise your hand if you've seen the True Cost movie before. About half, half maybe half of you. Um, I, I, th I think we've, the, the theme of uh, the two-day conference is, is so absolutely relevant. We are running out of time. We have to make such a shift in these next two, three years. And, and are we, in fact, as, a, as humankind, going to be in time. Um, you know, there, are, there are some very, very senior scientists that share that, that maybe it, we will not be in time, even if we make um, the huge efforts that we need to over the next five years. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my um, personal journey um, and, and then come to a, a number of different um, areas that I see in terms of some of the opportunities and the challenges for us to really move the debate forward uh, at a speed. So we know that now in the UK, 77% of CEOs um, appreciate that they have slavery in their supply chain. They know that figure is increasing because they're beginning to understand that, that, that their supply chain is something that they have to take responsibility for beyond first tier, um, right down to, to fifth and sixth tiers. And we also understand how big a polluter the fashion industry is. We also know that if we were able to use fashion as a tool for change and development, that we could actually develop so a model that created positive and social impact and that could be environmentally neutral or benign using some of the craft skills, the artisanal skills and organic agriculture to really liberate and empower uh, the global south. I think my journey very much started as a, an ethical consumer. I have a, an embarrassing confession, which is that I didn't actually pick up a fashion magazine before I started People Tree, which was when I was 25. I actually didn't like fashion magazines. And I think, for me, it was very much like many of your consumers, and, and, and perhaps some of you, as a, an ethical consumer in the late 80s, early 90s, hearing about... Uh, sportswear brands and, and denim brands, understanding that there were human rights violations. I wanted to be sure that I was using my money as a consumer uh, for social good. I didn't want to be part of the problem. I wanted to be part of the change. And I think you know, we, as a community, uh, have been able to grow through the fair trade fashion movement, through the ethical consumption movement, um, to promote democracy, to promote social inclusion. But I started um, 30, well, 28, 29 years ago in Japan, first visiting uh, some of the, um, the workers to understand what fair trade fashion should be fairer than. So I had to go into the slums. I spent a lot of time, firstly in factories, um, and then later on in, in the, the working environments uh, to understand what the issues were that garment workers face. And I think... First, as a human rights activist. Secondly, um, as a, an environmentalist, I learned quite quickly that actually human rights and uh, and social uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, human rights and environmental justice go hand in hand. That the very people that we're looking for fairer trade. Uh, to, to, to create an advantage and those livelihood opportunities and the length and steadiness of orders for 
are the people that are taking the brunt of environmental and climate change. And so I set about on this journey thinking, how can I create uh, a fashion product that really creates the maximum um, livelihood opportunity for people in women in rural areas? And I started with handicrafts, so looking at hand weaving, hand embroideries, hand block printing, natural dyes, and lace making, for example, hand knitting. And I used those skills to curate um, the First People Trees collections. And I think, for me, this was also, as a woman, realising um, the huge barriers that women face in countries like Bangladesh, India and Nepal, uh, where they have very little voice, partly because they have too little economic power, um, that we could create, if you like, this this opportunity of voice power um, through creating crafted um, hand-woven garments. And this is a, a small dress that we, we put together in uh, a project called Swallows in northern Bangladesh for Emma Watson's collection, uh, using um, organic cotton onto the hand looms. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll race a little bit, otherwise I'll run out of time. This is... Uh, a, a tiny exhibition um, in the first eco products um, uh, fair in Tokyo um, more than nine sorry I beg your pardon more than 25 years ago in fact um, the organization was called Global Village it started as a, an NGO um, to work on environmental issues and social justice issues so looking at how uh, the citizens could recycle how they could um, support vegan and vegetarian and organic food options. So by publishing information, we then realised that we had to offer people the opportunity of fair and organic foods, clothing and crafts. And in that little basket is my um, one-month-old son at the time, who's now 25 years old. I love the idea of the kids' council here, by the way, because um, he and um, his sister have, uh, over the period of developing People Tree, have really been my conscience and uh, the, uh, the logic and the clarity, I think, that a seven-year-old brings is very powerful. So I'm very excited to hear about the kids' council. So uh, I undertook supply chain development, although I didn't use those words at the time, what I knew is that I wanted to, uh, to bring organic cotton onto the hand looms because organic cotton for every uh, acre that was grown organically um, was saving 1.5 tonnes of CO2. It was being sequestered into the ground. It was creating uh, a soil that was fertile. It had live matter. And when you trod on it, it bounced like a sponge. Whereas with conventional cotton, it was rock hard, like tarmac. Um, so this was not just about the skin sensitivity and the fact that many of my consumers in Japan wanted a, a healthy, organic, breathable fabric with no chemical residue on it. It was also about uh, paying the farmers more and creating a healthy environment for them uh, and reducing um, actually water by 60% um, in, in that process. I think when we talk about social impact or social equity, we need to be thinking about environmental equity too. Um, because without question, uh, we've had a lot of discussion about cotton being... Uh, very highly consumptive of water. And I think whilst that is true, organic, uh, organic production of cotton, uh, especially in the, um, the, the areas that are, that are water-fed, that are naturally water-fed, um, I think there are some, uh, there's a, absolutely a very strong case, um, both in India and in many West African countries, for fair trade and organic cotton. Indeed, it was the um, debate around natural textiles that brought me um, to really experiment and, and to develop um, cloth also in, in nettle, um, in wool that was, uh, was, was coming from countries where we knew that the mulesing was not a problem. And I think now it's fantastic that the, the plastic debate um, has really livened up 
um, so that we understand that when we're using certain fabrics, be they polyester or nylon, um, that we have some, as many as a quarter of a million microfibers of about five millimetres um, washed um, every time we wash a garment of that kind. So more than 83% of our tap water um, actually is containing uh, these microfibers. Um, and I think plastics is an important debate for a number of reasons. I um, was staying in the, the lovely hotel yesterday and pulled out an organic tea bag that um, I was shocked to see um, was actually uh, a plastic. Um, can I give you that, sir? Um, whereas if you look at uh, the clipper tea, and this is, I think, one, one reason why we, as pioneer ethical brands, we really need to consider our brand option through and through. When we look at Clipper, um, we find that it's a, a paper tea bag. And I remember having developed the first uh, coffee bags um, using um, paper in Japan. We have an organic fair trade food company. So really, through and through, um, getting this message both of social equity and environmental equity uh, to our customers. So the fair trade principles, um, many of you know, and, and I think um, sit alongside the Fairware Foundation principles, um, really leading very much into um, what we're doing with our work with the Sustainable Development Goals. I would argue that actually one Sustainable Development Goal is missing, and this, this one is an 18th, which, which I think is PR communication of the goals. It's educating and galvanizing our communities and us and within our sector um, to really change the debate and broaden um, people's inclusion and action around each of these goals. So bringing the handwoven story, the craft story into um, beautiful dresses with uh, with designer collaborations. Um, this very lovely uh, Borax who hand-woven, hand-embroidered dress, actually I sent to Kate Middleton, but unfortunately she'd already decided on a different wedding dress. Um, so it came back from Buckingham Palace, but you can only try. Um, so I did the next best thing. I got one of the biggest fashion bloggers in Japan to come out to the village uh, and do a press trip um, with me. And we've constantly engaged, I think, the, the producers, the artisans, the workers. We've brought them to Tokyo, to Berlin, to London, to visit stores, to do media work, to, even to visit the, the retail centres and the wholesale um, key accounts. And we've done the reverse to take journalists and celebrities like Emma um, every, every year or so um, to really open up the debate around fair trade and ethical fashion and the reason that, that fast fashion uh, really has so many issues. Um, the collection that Emma um, designed for three seasons we sold in Japan and um, London and it was a a, a, a proper collection that went into production and, and sold extremely well. But I think it's, again, you know, taking on this storytelling with influencers and your ambassadors um, to really tell the story of how your products are different. And I, I think the storytelling part is absolutely key. I know with Fairware Foundation, you're using um, the, many of the, the marks here. Again, I'd like to encourage you to, to use other marks as you start to set um, new um, pioneering uh, initiatives. So we develop, for example, hand-woven mark, hand-knitting mark, the textile marks, because we knew that our Japanese um, and our European customers loved textile and loved craft, and they wanted to celebrate slow. So the social review process uh, we undergo every two years, um, looking at a multi-stakeholder approach, how we're doing over our different fair trade principles, which sets our agenda and our action plan um, for the next two years. Um, and we've taken as I say, the, the influencers on this journey. This is a Vogue collaboration that we did um, where the journalist said, well, we love the idea of handicraft and fair trade, but, but how can we make it more high fashion? And I think... 
that really helped us to start engaging with some very high-profile uh, designers and ambassadors. This is Zandra Rhodes, who made the organic cotton dress um, that I'm wearing for you today with her lovely prints. So I think when we were starting, um, I initiated World Fair Trade Day, which is the second Saturday in May um, every year. And I think this is a, an international celebration now um, that covers both the, the global south and the global north, um, with everything from fair trade hunger banquets to really consider um, our consumption habits on, um, on the global south and, uh, and to start this debate around fairer trade and social justice. The fashion revolution um, has, has really been a huge opportunity to engage more and more customers and um, consumers uh, and civil society around the world with more than 100 offices. I, I was recently with the, um, a digital um, analyst who said that, in fact, now ethical fashion and uh, fair trade and fair fashion, sustainable fashion, is, is beginning to be um, uh, overtaken by the word slow fashion. So again, I think there's a, a big opportunity here um, to look at slow fashion. And with that, I come on to Posey, where I've had uh, the opportunity to be managing director for two years, where I've been helping to develop the brand, set up the team, and also start a new supply chain, an ethical supply chain in Sri Lanka, uh, using organic cotton and fair trade rubber um, with one of the best factories in Sri Lanka. And I think, for me, one of the, having been a vegetarian for um, more than 25 years, it's been quite interesting, the debate around leather. Um, and it's, I think, for, for many of us, we know that, that mushroom leather and a number of other leather types are, are, are coming, but they're, they're yet to be commercialised. But I think this is really for us to be confident as brands, to be uh, not only researching and looking at these new innovations, but also helping to, to develop them and finance them wherever we can. So, well, um, yes, it will be interesting with Brexit, but we won't go into that. Um, we have uh, production in uh, Portugal and also in Sri Lanka. And uh, I think when, when we're looking at, uh, for example, developing a brand, we've started to work with Star Wars. Um, so we have a, a very, very big uh, collaboration that, that you'll see on the website alongside the, the mainline brand. Um, this has also been a very interesting dilemma in terms of marketing to a completely new community and setting up a supply chain um, that can also talk to a completely new market um, of, of people that are not familiar um, with ethical or fair trade. So, um, so slow fashion, I think, is um, very much becoming a theme. Many, uh, can, many people are, are questioning uh, the whole fashion model itself um, and saying, yes, will we actually, if we're very deep green, why would we ever buy again? And I think it's for us to, to explain how that purchasing of responsible fashion is so very important if people are going to buy new, um, but also to be... Uh, aware that there are rental um, opportunities coming up. There are lots of different types of initiative in upcycling um, also that we need to incorporate in our brands. But what's exciting for me is to see the, the expansion of um, eco-fashion stores, not just the beautiful department stores that are now curating um, very, very successfully um, ethical brands like your own, um, we actually have about 800 stores that sell People Tree today around Europe and Japan. And, uh, and those stores are being used as a, an opportunity to really expand the debate around uh, not just a fair, fair fashion, but also around uh, well-being, around democracy, and around the, the whole relationships that we, we have um, with, our, with ourselves and with others. Um, Slaves to Fashion is a, a book that, um, that I, I published a, a year and a half ago on modern slavery within the supply chain. And I just wanted to 
I know I'm rather over time, so I'm just going to run through a few slides. Really, this is not a new subject matter to, to you. I appreciate you're very, very familiar um, with it. Um, it was written um, very much to expand the, the awareness amongst, um, amongst people who would be uh, your customers um, going forward but to tell the stories of people that have been caught in slavery um, in, in both bonded and, and forced labour, also um, child labourers, um, people who have been human trafficked, um, so that these people come to life and we really understand uh, that, that our choices make such a huge and vital difference um, to them. So please, if, you, if you're interested in the book, I have some um, cards where I'm sitting. Um, I'll be very happy to organise to send you one. So really looking at, at the debate, um, Continental uh, and Fairware Foundation were, were wonderful also in supporting and helping me to, to introduce um, your brilliant work. So um, I, I think going forward, um, we have... Um, a huge opportunity around the, the fashion revolution. We have this, this time that is very much a clock ticking. We have um, the goodwill, the understanding, both of, uh, of, of, of civil society uh, and of the garment factory workers and the labour unions who want to be part of that change and now have the technology to do it. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity to share our, our partnering, our long-term vision, um, to, to really bring in more people into this sector um, to share best practice. I was recently um, with Baroness Lola Young at the House of Lords where large fashion brands um, were very, very open in um, how, they could, how they could offer uh, support to medium-sized brands to, to supply templates, for example, to move them forward. And I know that um, Fairware Foundation is also looking at tie-ups with, um, with organisations like that. I think we also have this opportunity to educate and to campaign um, to bring our customers and consumers on this journey with us. And I'd love to, to hear more from you about um, what you're doing in, in that regard to make um, the, the 18th Sustainable Development Goal one that we, as uh, an organisation, as a community, um, can really um, empower and spread. So, so that's it from me um, at the moment. I, I know we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah, we have tons. We have sufficient. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Safia. I love your idea of adding that 18th SDG goal, SDG, that 18th goal of, um, yeah, also making sure that PR and communications are more, um, yeah, on our attention as well. And I love to hear and uh, your very big inspiration on building bridges between what you do in the mud, in the supply chain, um, to or actually building the, the bridge between that and the consumer side. It's really interesting to see and I think it's a true inspiration for all of us, especially if you do a lot of work on human rights and the environmental side, to see how you manage to, to actually raise awareness and to make sure to connect dots. Thank you so much. Um, it's time for questions and you see behind me your questions. Let's see if there's... Um, Michael, you already yeah. had the opportunity to look at that. I had a peek. Is there any? Yes, I did. There's one this one from highlight. Christian. Can you really change the industry within the hyper-consumerist economic system that, we, that created these conditions? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Christian, I'll kill you. <laughs> Where, where's Christian? He's over here, I believe. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yes. Yes, I know Christian from his time back in, uh, in ASOS many, many years ago. Um, so, uh, interesting, interesting and an extremely valid question. I think that um, we, need, we need government to, to not only have laws, but to enforce laws to create a, a more level playing field. Um, because I think we're, uh, we're, we're trying to, to, to really, you know, 
cut a new path with one arm tied behind our back with um, you know, a, a huge backpack on our back. I think we, we really are um, struggling, actually, um, to make the difference at the speed that we need to. I was uh, attending a, a UBS conference as a <coughs> speaker last week, and I think, again, there are some, uh, some very interesting movements in, in finance and investment um, that will begin to look at uh, benchmarks for companies so that uh, finance, in the same way that now uh, we have the, the kind of old energy economies that are struggling actually to get finance and renewable energy is, is, is getting finance, we need to do the same with fashion. We need to be in a place where if it isn't ethical, if it's not sustainable, um, then finance must not, should not be available um, to these businesses. Um, but we, we, we have to educate the analysts, we have to educate uh, finance, but it is changing. Okay, thanks. And uh, let's see, you were talking about cotton, I believe this one is related to that, so from micro to macro to micro. Are smallholder farmers your source, I assume, part of a cooperative? If not, what mechanisms are in place to ensure fair payment? Uh, yes, they, they are cooperatives. Um, so, for example, we work with um, Agricel, and I know many of you will work with Chetna and other organisations like that. Um, so not only is it uh, organic, GOT certified, it, it would also be fair trade certified. Um, I think it's, it's imperative to do the two. Okay. Uh, then uh, from Peb... Uh, do you have a kids council? There are three questions there, but you'll be here a, a bit later, so I guess Peb will come to you with the other three that he has, or she. Uh, but do you have a, kid, a kids council yourself? No, and now my kids have become adults. I probably need a council of kids. I, I do have stepkids that are six and 11. I'd not actually thought of grooming them to be my kids council, but that's no, a very good idea. Um, in terms of, of child labour, I think... Certainly 20 years ago, when, we, when I personally discovered um, a 13-year-old working in one of my fair trade groups making craft, um, that very much helped me to understand some of the um, issues that had brought that child to, to working um, at the age of 13. Uh, she'd, she'd lost both parents. She, was, uh, she had a brother and sister. Um, but, but by working and partnering together with, with that fair trade group, we were able to um, offer her schooling, but to work at a very, very reduced number of hours a day. Um, and, and that did help over a long-term period. Yes, it's a huge issue. All right, um, thank you. Um, oh, pardon, go ahead. Yeah. You must have answered, I think. Um, I'm, I'm asking whether he, what he thinks about the answers. You like it? You want to say it? He says, oh, he's a bit shy. It's okay. You want to you communicate through the computer, right? Yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. Just yeah. wanted to check whether Savia Mini yeah. gave you the right answers. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, you know, what was really interesting, when my son was um, seven, we went to Indonesia together, and there was uh, a small girl his age making necklaces, selling them in, in the car park. And he said, Mom, you know, why isn't she at school? Why is she making necklaces? Um, and I said, well, her family are too poor. That's why she's having to sell necklaces, Jerome. And he said... That's crazy. Why don't you get her mum to make necklaces and sell them in your shop? And I said, well, Jerome, um, we would have to have more shops because she has friends also that we, and we should sell more. And this became a book, but it also became a kind of personal promise to my son that, yes, we should increase the number of shops to, to sell fair trade products so that, indeed, adults could afford to send their children to school. So I think, um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, just, I, I'm not sure how much time we still have, but still yeah, we can go? Cool. Uh, let's see. Maybe you see uh, one yeah. of the questions that, would you, that you would like to pick out? Yes, so um, yes, how do I think about better cotton and do you work on circular designs? Um, I think, 
Uh, I prefer GOTS. Um, the Better Cotton Initiative doesn't go far enough for me, but I think it's a great place for industry to start if they're new to it. Um, in terms of circular designs, we have tried, um, for example, um, zero waste dresses and patterns, and, and that has been very interesting. Um, I think it's a, it's a really good uh, opportunity to look at waste, offcuts, how you might recycle that into um, other product. Um, Yes, thank you. Um, how, how can we, we be the ethical consumers? That's a, a very good question. I think, I think we need to, uh, to, to make the journey um, as inspiring and as, as, as easy access as possible for people who are coming into, uh, into, the, um, into this way of thinking. I think there's also a real need now in, in Europe or in the West, I should say, to be as democratic as possible because um, certainly in my country there has been um, a huge uh, kind of gap created between a shrinking middle class, uh, the, the elite and, and the, um, the, 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 um, the, the working class poor um, and, and I think we have a situation now which is which is really quite dangerous where um, we have to make uh, and we have to use communications that truly engages um, people at every level of society to, 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 to be able to come and support um, other workers um, despite being of, of low income backgrounds themselves and I think this is where it's very exciting for you um, having big distribution um, to, to really be able to engage not only the uh, professional class and those with money, but to bring the message and to bring the product offer um, to people that have lower income levels. Yeah. Um, where's Matthijs Krité? Yeah, can you ask your question? That one. It's right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it it, it 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 basically continues what what actually what you were saying um, because the, the the very large fashion brands and retailers, um, of course, have to cope with you know the huge systems that they're sort of stuck to, um, and they're the ones delivering lower price clothing to to a lot of the people. So I was just wondering, of all the experience that you have, what would be the the advice that stands out that you could give to these large brands and retailers to accelerate the changes, because they're struggling as well, I think. Um, I, I, I think the, some of the biggest initiatives of success have been um, in uh, the, the, the middle management. They may be in charge of CSR, um, really galvanizing the C-suite, the CEO level. Um, to then begin to create strategy that works throughout the organization. So you have something driven by what I think many of, of you brands are, um, where your mission-driven businesses in a larger business, this is often not the case, you, things are siloed uh, between CSR and, and buying. And I think the biggest initiatives have been when um, the, the whole organization is galvanized by the CEO's view um, to implement sustainability and ethics throughout. Um, and this is not just supply chain, of course. This is throughout the practice of, of the business, the communication strategy. All right. Um, I think we have time for some more questions. Yeah. Uh, Jane Pillinger. Pillinger? Yeah, can you ask your question? The mic is coming your way, sorry. But it would be nice if you can do it in person. Hi, an inspiring... It's on. An inspiring journey, thank you very much. Um, yeah, my question was just about what can companies do to end violence against women? And it's violence against women in the factories themselves. It's the impact of domestic violence in the workplace itself, and how can that be linked into building stronger social dialogue? It's an enormous question, but I think is, is one that concerns an increasing number of companies at the moment, which is, is, is really good. And to see that being discussed and elaborated and through social dialogue and through agreements with, with trade unions um, is a real platform to build on. 
So it was really a question about how, what advice you would give to companies about this. Yes, I, th I think women on boards are in increasingly, uh, increasingly able to, to take up the plight of women throughout the business and throughout the supply chain. Um, certainly, when suppliers or, or fair trade groups would come uh, to, to, to me uh, and say, you know, we, we want to build a partnership with you. The, the two factors were um, their openness to environmental um, and sustainability initiatives, uh, and the second one um, was their policy and their inclusion of women in, in middle management and senior management. And I think um, that, that, is, that is absolutely key. I think the sexual harassment and the silent violence against women in the global south, um, I mean, it's, it, in, the northern, in, in, in the north also in, in some respects, is something that we, we absolutely must see as, as part of, of the campaign for, um, for true social inclusion and equity. Um, it is certainly, there's, there are a number of films that I've made around slave to, to fashion. And I, I, I think that the, the sexual harassment component um, was, was what I found so very shocking. I know Fairware Foundation also has some fantastic resources to help with these issues, to, to really bring um, women's issues to the fore. Um, with um, Marius yesterday at Continental, we were talking about... Um, you know, starting a um, uh, kind of a, dare I say it, a, a female hygiene product in the factories that would be easily accessible, something like a moon cup, um, that, that allowed women, you know, the, 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 the opportunity, the security, but also, you know, often they're spending, you know, one or two days salary um, on, on buying a female hygiene product. So again, I think there's there's lots and lots of opportunities, really, when we, we think about women in the workplace and when we think about the kinds of problems that they face that are unique to them and the structures that we can incorporate in the factory and in our own purchasing policy to make these changes. But women on boards, absolutely vital. Uh, we have this one. Is How can a supplier join fair trade? Um, well, th there are many fair trade organisations and suppliers that join, for example, the World Fair Trade Organisation. Um, so if you look at worldfairtradeorganisation.com, um, there's a place where you can, you can look at the, uh, the principles, you can, you can apply, you can go and meet members locally. Um, you can also join a biannual conference so that you understand um, what the requirements are. Um, I... I Personally, I think it's a very, very interesting platform, especially if you're a craft supplier um, and, and certainly an agricultural um, supplier. So I think there's, there are various um, other options also for fair trade suppliers like uh, Common Objective. You can register with Common Objective, for example, in the UK um, as a supplier to find buyers. Um, yes, I think, I think those two are, are the, the, the standouts. All right. Let's see, we have a few more. I think you've answered the majority of those. Uh, well, here's a good one by uh, Chit, is how can you make sure the whole supply chain in your business is ethical? Um, when, we, um, when we went on the journey of piloting the um, fair and sustainable management system for welfare trade organization, um, we, we were able to look through the majority of our supply chain, um, we would look, for example, at uh, buttons, how they were produced, what materials they were being produced with, the interfacings, if they were eco-interfacings, um, YKK zippers, for example. But I think we, there, it was difficult for us to go as a tiny, tiny brand buying only tens of thousands of zippers. It was very difficult for us to check for example, those factories of those suppliers. But in terms of um, the organic cotton um, and the, um, the tiers of um, manufacture, so hand weaving, uh, tailoring, um, and the actual materials, we were able to cover those. We also looked at diaffluent uh, management projects in the, um, the village areas, so that helped us to understand and to support 
um, to ensure that we were not polluting um, the village environs by, by helping to finance those. Um, I think in some cases, um, for example, with, um, with wool, um, it, was, it, was, it was quite difficult at the time. For example, organic wool didn't exist. Now it does. Um, so I think we were, we were also consolidating with other buyers in Nepal, for example, to import wool from, uh, from New Zealand um, so that we would have more buying power and through that collaboration we could import and get more transparency on uh, wool fibre. Okay, thank you so much. Thank there you. are still a lot of interesting questions. There's also some questions about whether we can share the presentation and everything. We'll go through everything and uh, make sure that those things are also uh, kept in mind. For now, thank you so much. Thank you. For your one last question, please. Okay, the, okay. the final one. Eric. Uh, last question. My name is Eric Roos of Health Disease. I will explain more after the break. You said you just have to try how to communicate together. And you asked, what can you learn from us? How to make sustainability go to the consumers? I want to present you something like you did with the Queen she returned it. I hope you will keep it. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> it's okay, it's not a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> no. We just also presented it to the Minister of the Netherlands, but she left so fast, so we did it outside. But I don't know oh. if you will stay, yes or no. I'm staying. Okay. Uh, what this is, this is Healthy Seas Socks. We are proudly fair wear leader. We work with God's Organic Cotton. And we have diving teams all over Europe, cleaning the oceans, taking the fish nets, breaking down to monocles, making yarns and make our socks. Fantastic. Sustainability, it's about communication, not about doing behind the scenes. So thank you for your presentation. Thank I you. hope you will keep it. Thank you, I will. I'll okay. treasure it and I'll use it to educate others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Safia. Okay, now it's time for a short break. We'll take 20 minutes to get some refreshments from the bar. 30 minutes even, you're lucky. To digest all the wise words of Safia and all the other speakers. And um, two more things. Pep, our lovely kid reporter, will be walking around to talk to you, so keep an eye out. And there's a photo booth on the back of the room to strike a pose as part of the member garments e expo. Okay, enjoy your drink. Sun is coming through. Oh, you feel my love.